Hey there. Well, I finally got done watching Ben Shapiro's lecture and questions and answers at Berkeley. And there were two things that stood out to me. One of them, well, there's a few other things that stood out, like how the guy that was holding the mic and wouldn't let the person speaking hold the mic just is like, look, just nervous all the time, like, yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, he didn't, his hand didn't shake, but the look on his face had this look like, oh, oh, there's a person next to me. And then, you know, when you're, I mean, this is obviously a light bulb, but it, you don't hold the mic this far away and, 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 and like, like this, you have to go like this to hear it. But he consistently held the mic as if he doesn't know how to handle any audio equipment. That's not very important, but uh, it's just something that I noticed throughout the, the entire questions answers uh, session. The first real thing, though, that I noticed was when this person was asking Ben Shapiro about insurance and how right now insurance companies are able to charge more to men than they are women based off of, oh, well, you know, they're shown to, men are shown to be more risk takers. And so he said, well, what if companies decided to do this based on race, if they found that sort of thing? And he couldn't get Ben Shapiro to even admit the thing about what's going on with men and women. He just kept going around into his, the standard uh, libertarian ideology that it the, the market will just take care of it and when this guy was showing that you know no the market really won't take care of this Ben Shapiro ignores it and tries to make the guy feel like his question was dumb let me show you uh, hello Mr. Shapiro um, you have consistently praised the free market as the most effective means by which to combat racism sexism etc yes right uh, you believe legislation prohibiting such behaviors is essentially unneeded in today's day and age because you have faith that people such as yourself are conscious enough to fight discrimination in business where it can be shown and at the end of the day a business should be given immense freedom to conduct itself in the pursuit of profit. My question is as follows. If insurance companies can charge young males as a group higher prices for car insurance than young females because the former has statistically been shown to be more reckless drivers does this not leave open the possibility in a free market system for insurance companies to charge premiums based on certain ethnic or racial categories if these ethnic or racial categories statistically correlate with more reckless driving? If you object to the notion of charging someone more based on a factor that that person has virtually no agency in choosing, such as race or sex, why do you not condemn the fact that young men have to pay more? If you do not object to the possibility that a person of a certain sex ethnic or racial group may have to pay more on that basis, then are you not failing to disavow discriminatory business practice? Okay, so uh, that's a long paragraph, but I think what it really boils down to, the answer is that what you're taught, you're now conflating ethnic uh, racism with risk factors. Okay, right. I don't conflate racism with risk factors, meaning if you are saying that, that insurance companies may use being black as a proxy for heart disease, for example, because black men suffer from heart disease at a higher rate right. than white men do of the same age once you hit a certain age, uh, then my answer is that an insurance company is in the business of assessing risk, not in the business of assessing racism. So if they look at you and they say that this is a higher risk factor, I mean another case, sickle cell anemia, right? There are certain diseases that actually do afflict races differently. Tay-Sachs affects Jews differently. Uh, so the answer is you're an insurance company, of course you're going to charge more to somebody who has a higher risk factor. That's not racism. That's just the profit motive. I'm not saying that everyone's going to get charged the same in an insurance scheme. Of course not. I assume that you and I won't be charged the same. They'll, they'll me I'm older than you, presumably. They'll measure our bodily health. I don't know how much pot you smoke. Like they'll make a bunch of distinctions. You know, and they'll, they'll make a bunch of decisions as to what our risk factors are and how that measures out in terms of what I need to pay in order to cover my projections. But that has nothing to do with, with quote-unquote discrimination. That's just a basic market decision. Right. That's so, actuarial decision. So actuarial just for actuarial clarification, so there was a study in which, uh, I, I forgot what organization of the United States federal government did it, but Native Americans in Arizona were found to have, you know, um, to essentially be engaged in fatal car crashes at a higher rate than any other group. Okay. You think it's perfectly permissible for insurance companies to charge someone um, a surplus, I mean, just charge someone an extra premium 
by virtue of the fact that they are Native American in Arizona? No, I think it's fair for an insurance company to charge someone based on the risk factor of driving. So what I would suggest is that in a free market system, this is why I defend a free market system, let's say there was an insurance company who did what you're talking about. Right. Right? And the insurance company decided Native Americans get charged more. Okay. There would be another insurance company that would come along and they would say, okay, is it really true that Native Americans universally are being charged more or can I undercut my competitor by looking at people on an individual level and looking at all of their risk factors apart from race? Because race is not inherently right, linked to drunk driving. That happened with males. Because, for instance, not all males, you know, are going to be in and of it themselves like more reckless drivers than females. However, uh, like, as you said, neither is that the case. But for, this is why, I mean, let, let's be right? real about this. This is why car insurance companies have good driver discounts, for example. They have good student discounts, right? They actually do look at more. As you've seen, completely bypassing everything the guy is trying to say. He just doesn't want to look at it. He, he can't look at it. His ideology, his libertarian ideology, won't let him look at it. Marion, don't look at it. Shut your eyes, Marion. Don't look at it, no matter what happens. Then you just, like my insurance rates went up through the ceiling when I got caught going down the I-5 at 113 and had my license suspended for a month. They've gone right. down since because okay. I haven't had a ticket for five years. So, you know, this is, <laughs> so okay. the point that I'm making is that if you are suggesting that, if you're trying to line up discrimination with market-based profit, if your question is, is that, can you imagine a situation in which a business makes more money by discriminating and would that be okay? then the answer would be, it's a, free, it's a business, you can do what you want in a free society, and I have no right to use your services. Don't look right! Keep your eyes shut! However, it has yet to come to my attention that racial discrimination in a business is an actual profitable thing over time in a free market system where people can compete, because race is not inherently connected to behavioral categories, right? The basis of racism is that race is connected to behavior. Well, I'd just like to say, for instance, um Thomas Sowell point, pointed out, like in his book, uh, uh, Black, uh, Rednecks, White Liberals, or whatever. Yes. That the Irish. It's actually the Irish. Right, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, go ahead. That, Sorry. That, right. It's a good book, yeah. I got that data point. You got it. Uh, <laughs> he pointed out that the Irish, for instance, were in the Americas for hundreds upon hundreds of years locked in destitute, grinding poverty. Right. Okay, so you just said that race, you know, if, if you're a co company and you institute racist policies, um, won't, like, like there's no long-term gain to be made from those policies. And right. I think that that's erroneous to say, because as you know, inequities, inequalities, disparities do exist between certain communities. So... You'd have to show I, me I the disparity based on race and why it's biologically inborn as opposed to cultural. I'm, I'm not trying not... to say that it's not biologically born. I'm just saying that if you had a policy whereby you... Okay, I don't want you to I confound, know. here's the problem I'm having, and I think we can stop with this, because but I don't want to confound race with behavior unless you can show me that race is the inerrant source of the behavior. The only way that what he said is making sense is if he believes wholeheartedly that men are the ones to take risks and women are not, and therefore women should have lower insurance rates. And if it is the inherent source of the behavior, then we can have a separate discussion. But I don't see that. And if you show me that race is, in fact, that, then that's, that's a separate discussion as to whether we have to force businesses not to take race into account. Is that fair? Yeah, thank okay. you. It's not fair at all. But, you know, he won't allow the discussion to go there because of his libertarian ideology. And let's make it clear, libertarianism is an ideology. It's just as bad as how feminism can be, it's just as bad as how the Antifa can be, it's just as bad as fundamentalist Christians. It's an ideology. So now we get his views about how he thinks the churches should take care of the poor and those that are downtrodden and those that are having issues. The church should take care of all of that. Here it is. Is that the government exists to preserve certain basic rights, and then you have social institutions that need to provide the safety net for the rest of society. So I'm very much for a strong church uh, in regards to communal life. I mean, I belong to a synagogue. I believe that if you fall on hard times, 
then that means that the first thing that you need to do is go to your family, and then the second thing you need to do is go to your church, and then you go to your local community, and then up the scale. The problem that I see in society right now is that people go to the top of the scale, the federal government, they don't bother with anybody lower down on the scale, which is why you see this consistent growth in the federal government. I think that's a sick view, but whatever. Now we get to hear him, and this is his continuation of what he was just saying. So this isn't a completely separate clip from what you just saw. This is him continuing what he was saying. And this is him showing his dominionism. It's pretty blatant. It doesn't get any more blatant than this. And this sort of thing is something worth having a counter protest about. But most of the people out there are saying stuff like, go away fascist, go away fascists, go away fascists over and over again and, and rioting and all that sort of thing. Judeo-Christian values, as I've said a thousand times, are the root of the, of the civilization and cannot be ripped away without collapsing the civilization on top of it. So again, this isn't fascism. This isn't white supremacy. This is dominionism and reconstructionism.